Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 CSPC pre-conference Zoom session. The title of today's session is A Sustainable Future and the Holistic Approach the Healthcare Industry Needs to Apply. Before going any further, I'd like to take a moment to mention that the Ganyone Haga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which I am today. Josh Diagay, known today as Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is the home of a diverse population of indigenous and other point peoples. Roche respects the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I'll more formally introduce myself. My name is Anthony Karen. I'm the Regional Lead Access Health Policy and Government Relations for Roche Diagnostic Canada. And Roche Diagnostic Canada is proud to organize today's panel with discussions with recognized experts from various regions throughout the country. To begin, I'll briefly present our organization. Roche is a global leader in healthcare. We are developing integrated, developing, sorry, integrated healthcare solutions to help patients live longer and better lives. We're focusing on oncology, immunology, ophthalmology, infectious diseases, neuroscience, metabolic, and rare diseases. Our leading position in diagnostics and pharma empower healthcare systems around the world to deliver thoroughly personalized healthcare ensuring patients are getting the best out health outcomes when needed. Oh, sorry, I'll go back one. The Roche Group has been uh, founded in 1896, being still today one of the largest uh, family-owned companies worldwide. The Hoffman LaRoche family has been truly passing a better organization to the next one. It is natural for our organization to maintain their long-term care focus while doing now what patients need next. Roche Canada started its uh, activities in 1931. Our pharma and diagnostic divisions have been actively contributing, contributing sorry, um, recently to fight the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada and around the world. For 13 consecutive years, our company has been uh, named and ranked um, within the three most sustainable healthcare companies by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, based on our economic, social, and um, environmental performance. So this ranking really reflects our commitment to consistently run our business in an ethical and responsible way. Last slide to conclude our presentation of uh, the presentation of our organization, our mission, as mentioned earlier, doing now what patients need next, is fully aligned with our sustainable development perspective, and we aim to improve the lives of people in society, but especially the lives of uh, patients. So, coming back to today's sessions, I will talk about the importance of the healthcare industry to be sustainable. Um, we'll address the three dimensions of sustainability, social, economic, and um, environmental pillars. Those three players, they play a significant role in how future generations will make choices and address growing needs moving forward. Our panelists will explore the benefits of incorporating the holistic approach in the care of patients, in, into the care of patients uh, received. The future of healthcare needs to make sustainability a priority and our panel of experts will demonstrate the impact for future generations to come through uh, current examples. So on this slide, you have um, a picture of our uh, various experts during today's panel discussion. Um, I'll have the opportunity to more formally introduce them right before their respective uh, presentation, but you can see that uh, our experts uh, represent uh, well-known organizations uh, across the country. To start with the Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Synergy Santé Environment in the province of Quebec, Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services in BC, and uh, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. Before inviting our participants to uh, 
present their respective expertise. Uh, I'd like to present basics of, of sustainability, just to make sure that everyone's understanding, um, just to ensure that everyone's understanding of the main concept. So in 1987, uh, the United Nations defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising uh, the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. To ensure sustainable, sustainable future, Rose Holistics approach um, incorporate all three uh, dimensions, all three pillars of sustainability. The social pillar uh, representing how we contribute to better tomorrow for all. The environmental pillar uh, representing how we minimize our impact on nature. And last but not least, the economic pillar, how we invest in medical advances, create jobs and ensure uh, livelihoods. On this slide, you have a quote from our uh, chairman and um, representing and, 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 and talking about the interdependence of all three uh, elements of sustainability and uh, mentioning that we will not be successful in the long run, long term without meeting our environmental um, and social responsibilities. And equally, we cannot contribute to society and environmental protection without economic uh, success. On this slide, you have uh, all 17 sustainable uh, development goals that have been developed uh, and identified in 2015 by all United Nations uh, members. Essentially, they aim uh, at ending poverty, protecting planet, and ensuring that everyone enjoys uh, peace and prosperity. As a community members or corporate citizens, we all have positive, neutral, or negative impact on each and every of these goals. So this is why sustainability is so important for all of us today. Before inviting our uh, speakers to present, one last slide, um, just to demonstrate the need to set ourselves sustainability goals. We have climate change being one of the greatest challenges of all time. The quality of life is threatened uh, around the world. We have billions of people who don't have access to medical care and diagnostics. We're facing enormous disparities across the world. And last but not least, we've been facing uh, global health threats such as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We, that just uh, ended a couple of months ago. On that note, I'll invite um, our very first uh, speaker today, Jérôme Ribes, um, to present. Jérôme is currently a Synergy Santé Environment Associate Director. With Dr. Zah Zigbee back in 2006, he created a non-for-profit organization based in Montreal that has for mission to help Quebec healthcare institutions to reduce their environmental impact. Since its creation, SSE has assisted 18 Quebec healthcare institutions in greening their operations. Jerome has a master's degree in environmental and occupational health from University of Montreal. And during his presentation, Jerome will uh, demonstrate that healthcare institutions are big greenhouse gas emitters. So Jerome, over to you. Thanks a lot, Antonio. I will share my screen. Here it is. Oops. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So uh, thanks again, Antonin. Um, so um, as Antonin uh, mentioned, uh, we are based in Montreal. Uh, so we are working with uh, uh, healthcare facilities across Quebec. But I've been uh, on the board of directors of the Canadian Coalition for quite a long time. So uh, I, I will uh, especially talk about Quebec, but I think some of the things I, I will be talking about are uh, totally uh, applicable to the rest of Canada. So um, healthcare organizations, as uh, Antonin mentioned, uh, have a, a big, big impact on the environment. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, healthcare organizations across Canada have been working a lot on sustainability for the past 10 to 15 or more uh, years. Uh, but as Antonin mentioned, we, we are facing a, a, a big threat, uh, climate change. So uh, healthcare organizations must now work uh, on adaptation to climate change, but uh, also on reducing their um, um, green, green emission, um, um, GEG emissions, sorry. So um, 
the idea today is to show you what's uh, what's happening uh, uh, in Quebec. Um, first of all, I will try just to come back to uh, a little bit of uh, uh, just explanation, just to be sure that everybody is following me. Uh, so, uh, uh, GHG emissions, uh, in order to uh, to to do a, a an audit, a carbon audit of of this, you have to um, uh, focus on on three main uh, emissions. Uh, it's called scopes. Uh, so that's uh, um, that's been uh, put together by the, the GG protocol. Uh, so you've got scope one. That's direct emissions. Um, a way to just view it is, you know, if you could see it, it would be emissions that you you would see uh, in the facility or just ahead of the facility. So it can be, you know, natural gas that you're burning. Uh, it could be fuel that you're burning on site, but it could also be, you know, the fuel used by the um, the vehicles uh, um, owned, owned by uh, an hospital, for example. Then you've got the scope two. Scope two, it's indirect emissions uh, linked to energy. So um, basically, you know, it can be electricity. Uh, so the 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 green uh, the 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 GHG emissions are not you know directly ahead of the hospital, but it's been generated elsewhere before uh, you're using electricity. Then you've got scope three. That's everything else. So it can be something that, as you can see uh, at the bottom, the upstream activities. So, you know, all the emissions that have been generated uh, just for you to get uh, the medical devices you will be using, uh, for example, for the employees to come to work, uh, for the patients to come to the hospital. So that's everything that's generated before. But you've got also things that you are generating after. Essentially, it would be waste uh, for healthcare facilities, but it could be uh, lots of other, other things. So when you've got all this, you can do uh, what uh, what is called a carbon audit. So or, uh, it's a GAG emission audit. Uh, and that's what we've been doing uh, with uh, healthcare organizations across Quebec. So um, in 2022, we did the first carbon audit, uh, scope one, two, three, so a global carbon audit, uh, including everything uh, that's happening uh, uh, in uh, healthcare organization with a big institution north of Montreal. Uh, so that's the uh, CIS de Laval. So it's uh, an organization regrouping uh, an hospital, uh, few long-term care facilities, clinics, you've got uh, readaptation centers, you've got youth centers in it. So uh, a pretty big institution with different kind of, uh, of missions uh, uh, in the healthcare system. And what we saw uh, is, uh, is this. So um, the, the, I think something that's really important is that the scope one and scope two, so all the emissions linked to energy are pretty small in uh, the, uh, you know, in, in, in the portrait. So it's uh, around 10 person. That's what we've seen also in other, other provinces, in other countries across the world. So it's uh, usually the, you know, the main thing on, on which we are focusing, but it's not you know, uh, it's just a small part of the emissions of a healthcare organization. What's the most important is the scope tree. So, you know, everything else I showed you early, earlier. If we want to 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 uh, illustrate this, we can say uh, for the CIS de Laval that purchasing uh, accounted for 42% of GG emissions. Pharmaceuticals, so I'm taking a look at Rush, it's a huge chunk of the uh, of the GHG emissions, 13 person. So when you're comparing two scope one and two together, the pharmaceuticals are just generating more GHG emissions than the energy or you know, the consumption of fuel from the, the vehicles on by an hospital, for example. Then you've got food, of course. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, different kind of services. You've got medical devices and also an, 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 um, anesthetics gases uh, that are uh, a small amount, but you know, pretty tough. Uh, um, uh, GG uh, um, uh, so greenhouse gases uh, generating a lot of, uh, um, um, you know, eating uh, power. So. Then you've got transportation, you know, we are in North America, 
Uh, we are just driving long distance. People are living far from uh, their job. Uh, so uh, we we uh, just a quick uh, uh, quick um, uh, thing here is that transport. It's uh, only transport from you know the the, the people uh, employees uh, from home to work, but also the professional transport. Uh, we we. We tried, but it was not, uh, you know, an accurate data, enough accurate data, but we tried also to estimate, you know, the transports coming from the visitors and the patients and also the the transports coming from the suppliers uh, and that's a big chunk to suppliers so probably transport it's uh, uh, you know uh, um, a higher amount of GG emissions but the interesting thing is that it, the you know the percentage is in concordance to the percentage of transports in the province of Quebec when Quebec is doing its uh, GG emission audit then we've got energy so natural gas, main uh, main one, electricity also. We are, you know, lucky in Quebec. We've got uh, pretty green energy, but we want it also to include, you know, everything else. So, you know, when you've got uh, uh, Hydro Quebec in, in, in Quebec, they are using trucks, they are using cars to do the job. So we've been including also this uh, uh, in in uh, in this. So energy, electricity uh, in Quebec, it's not zero percent, you know, it's a certain uh, percentage and we are using lots of energy. So it's accounting for 30 percent at the end. And then we've got waste, you know, waste around 6%. Uh, and that's uh, that's it. So, you know, based on this, the work we've been uh, uh, doing with that single institution, we decided to propose something a bit crazy. So uh, we decided to push an innovative project in Quebec. Uh, so we... we just sit with the Canadian, uh, the, um, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and with a, a big uh, foundation uh, here in Quebec, the Trottier Family Foundation. And we just imagine uh, how could we just push this single example, working with a single institution and trying to, you know, just make things easier for healthcare organizations and especially also, you know, being able to compare uh, institutions between themselves. So the idea, and that's what we are doing right now, is to conduct a three-year project with 10 to 12 uh, healthcare institutions in the greater um, Montreal area. And the main objective is just to enable them to do carbon audits by themselves. So they don't need to have consultants doing that with them and they understand, you know, what they, they are doing. The same as what they are doing each year with their, their financial report. You know, they will have a carbon report each year. They will be able to read it, to understand it, and then to uh, just elaborate an action plan to effectively reduce their GHG emissions. So during the three years of the project, we will be carrying, uh, carrying out two carbon audits with them. Um, just explaining them, working with them. And that the, the, the main uh, thing here is that we won't do the job for them. We will help them do the job, but they will do it by themselves with our help. It's a, a, a bit different from uh, uh, just doing the job from them uh, uh, in a um, you know, consulting perspective. Then, uh, and I think that's the, the, the main point and the, the most interesting point of this project is that we are at the present time working all together to build a common methodology adapted to the Quebec healthcare sector but that could be you know, exported to the rest of Canada probably. We've got working groups. An expert committee. We will. Uh, we are assessing the needs, the difficulties. So when I was just showing you what's a carbon audit, scope one, scope two, scope three, we are going through each, uh, you know, kind of emission with uh, healthcare organizations participating to project, and we are just saying, you know, how can we get accurate data or the most accurate data to assess for each uh, uh, parameters. And that's what we are doing. We will, uh, you know, write educational sheets. We will write a complete methodological, methodological guide. The idea at the end is to say, you know, if something is not in the audit, it doesn't exist. And we want every, everything to be there 
even if the data is not that accurate. And the interesting thing is that we've been talking a lot with uh, NHS uh, in the past year, and that's what they are doing at the present time. You know, they are putting everything, but some of the data are not, uh, you know, the, the 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 best ones, but they are there. So uh, that's a, a big project. And the thing that we want healthcare organizations to do with this is to support the objectives of COP21, COP26, saying that healthcare organizations must reduce their GAG emissions to the level the government of Quebec and the government of Canada have, uh, um, you know, agreed uh, in these uh, international meetings. So the idea is to reduce effectively the GAG emissions in the next years until 2040. So thanks, Adam. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. Jerome. I'm just sorry, just end. Oops. Your presentation was very, very informative. Um, I, I mean, I really like the innovative project you just talked about. I think it, it's brilliant to to assist healthcare institutions and and empower them to to be able to um, calculate and measure their own impact. Um, and giving them the tools. So, so thank you very much again for, for sharing this uh, with us today. Our, our second uh, presenter uh, today is Gigi Wong. Uh, Gigi is currently the clinical pharmacy specialist for quality with Lower Mainland Pharmacy Services, which encompasses for, uh, for local health authorities that cover most of the greater Vancouver area. She strives to increase pharmacy stewardship for planetary health to inspire action towards more sustainable practices. Gigi completed her pharmacy degree at the University of Toronto, her hospital residency at St. Joe's in Hamilton, Ontario, and her master's of public health at the University of British Columbia. During our presentation, Gigi will focus on pharmaceutical waste and the impacts on the environment and on a targeted organism. So Gigi, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Antonin. And um, we're going to change into another perspective about holistic needs for healthcare moving forward. And Jerome focused um, on the greenhouse gases. And myself, um, because I'm a pharmacist, I think about um, some of the risks that I think mostly pharmacists might think about. And I'd love to share it with you today. <clears throat> All right. So, oops. Yes, this is. Um, uh, who I am and where my education is from. So the objective for my time here with you is to understand why drugs are unique chemical risks, describe how pharmaceuticals enter the environment, and to be able to I, we lost the, I think, did, you? did I come back? Okay, sorry, I don't, it just dropped. Let me see. You're back. Am I back? Yeah, you're good. Perfect, okay. thanks. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and to know the precautionary principle. Um, and to focus on the topic of pharmaceuticals, typically people think about it um, in different ways. <clears throat> and there's three main aspects. So the first is the physical waste from the plastics, the packaging. The second is global warming potential from some of the propellants or gases that um, worsen the um, greenhouse gases that are in our planetary um, atmosphere. And then <clears throat> lastly, there is the drug itself, which is the focus of this talk, um, which we call um, the active pharmaceutical ingredient that is in the drugs that we um, give to our patients. Um, and just the um, planetary health, actually, in addition to the climate change angle, there's lots of other boundaries. And just to acknowledge that um, there's other boundaries here and that the drugs are actually part of the upper right one here, which is part of the novel entities and all the chemicals that we use, and which also actually includes like fragrances or cleaning or industry chemicals or um, personal care products and drugs also as part of this. And so the reason why pharmaceuticals are unique risks is because they're designed to cause a desired effect in the target organisms. So mostly it's humans for therapeutic use. And um, the interesting thing, if you think about it, is that we actually share a common physiology with other living things. And so this only makes sense because the early stages of drug development uses animals. Um, in the um, early stages, we use mice and rats, and then we progress to larger animals such as rabbits, 
dogs and, and cats. Um, and the only reason that makes sense is there are receptors that are preserved across the different taxonomy as we go along. <clears throat> and so the main mode of entry into the environment, if you've never thought about it, is actually from human consumption. And so most of the time it's excreted through urine and feces as it's the drug itself or it might get metabolized and those may or may not be active um, chemicals. Um, and the thing is that sewage plants are actually not designed to remove drugs, although some may be in the process, but they're not designed to. And what happens is that the pharmaceuticals actually enter our surface waters via our sewage effluents, which are the waters that leave the waste water treatment plants. And so naturally that means that the more that our society takes and, the, and our population, the more will be excreted and therefore more will enter our shared environment. And so I'd like to give you the example um, that this example is very special to me because it's the one that really got me and really stuck with me to try to keep doing this work and talk about it. And the story is about um, vultures and it's the three local species of vultures in Southeast Asia. And um, they're the white and the long build and the slender build. And the crazy thing is that this log graph shows what happened to them. This is a log graph, which means each increment on the y-axis is a tenfold change. And what happened is that within the lightning speed of 15 years, it was responsible for killing 99.9% .9 of the vultures. And when I first learned about this, I was so horrified. I think I had to like read it like four times and like bare fact check it. And, and it's true. And the mystery drug, the great reveal um, for today is it was diclofenac something so seemingly benign um, and that we have in Canada too, non-prescription as a topical gel and prescription in a oral tablet format. <clears throat> and maybe you're wondering how did, it, how did it kill the birds? Well, a well-known adverse effect of this drug class that diclofenac belongs to is kidney failure, one to 5%. And guess what? The vultures died from kidney failure. Um, from consuming the livestock carcasses because they're scavengers. And they actually, the more detailed is they got uric acid buildup and there was gout all over their internal organs. There's some um, uric acid precipitates on this particular <clears throat> narcropsy. Um, and as a pharmacist, I wanted to kind of, you know, compare what, what type of dosing are you talking about? And this is a classic textbook um, uh, diagram of where doses come from, if you've ever wondered. Um, and so the green curve is the curve that there's a therapeutic effect and ED is the effective dose in 50% of the subjects. The purple one is the toxic effect and the red one is a lethal effect where half of the subjects will die. And so I did the math, crunched the numbers, what's the dose for humans? What's the dose that they died from the literature? And when adjusted for weight in milligrams per kilogram, and firstly, I know that the pharmacokinetics or the pharmacodynamics, which is what the drug does to the body or the body of the drug to the drug by the vultures can be different. But the fact is we don't study that. So we actually don't know how it affects all these different types of living things with different physiologies. But if we adjust it just by weight, it means that what is five to 10% of a therapeutic human dose is a 100% lethal dose in vultures. And so I think this is a very impactful image because it really illustrates that we don't actually have any idea what these drugs and trace amounts and chronic or acute exposures, uh, what are they're doing to all the living things that are out there in our ecology and our environment. The second example I'd like to share is the impacts of um, on fish, which is my second example. And as actually a local Canadian example, we have an internationally recognized area called Experimental Lake Area. And the study was conducted over seven years and the fish were exposed to estrogen. And there's a, this is where it is in Ontario, if you're curious, because I didn't know about it um, uh, before. And what happened is that they, the exposure is the chronic dose uh, of estrogen that mimics what we would find in the real world that the fish might get exposed to. And the dose that they got is five to six nanograms per liter of water. And I kind of flipped it around as it's five to six grams in one trillion liters of water. Um, just to kind of show, like, I think we get desensitized to sometimes those units are so small. We don't even sometimes understand what that means. Um, and then the synthetic estrogen is the one that's commonly found in birth control bills, EE2 for sure. And so what happened to the fish? Um, A, the male fish became intersex and they also started having eggs, which I was also horrified to learn 
um, when I was doing this work. And it also affected their ability of the fertilized eggs to progress into offspring. And furthermore, what also happened is explained in this diagram. So the left side is the control lake with no exposure to estrogen. The right side is the lake that they introduced estrogen to over a span of three years. And if you look at this graph, you can see that <clears throat> there's like no fish left. And basically, ultimately, it leads to that entire fish exposed to that to extinction. And it's very sad if you like look at this image and realize what, what is happening. The third example actually is kind of a spin back is, is actually us that were impacted um, because everything that it harms kind of the animals, the planet actually harms ourselves. And so the part two of the story, chapter two, is that there's a cultural emotional impact um, because the sky burials actually had to be stopped because there were no more vultures. So vultures are considered sacred and they scavenge on organic matter to en enable the circle of life. And so in the local um, Parsi and Tibetan Buddhists, the tradition is that they actually use the vultures as part of their burial ceremony to bury their loved ones. And it's, it's part of their culture. Um, and so that's a horrifying thing that you can't bury the people you love and, and that they're not part of the history that's been established for decades and years. And the part three of this chapter three is there's also public health impacts as well. So the human remains are accumulating and there's a public health problem that's emerging. And furthermore, there's an increase of public health rabies transmission because of the lack of the vultures. There's more in wild dogs that are over proliferating and the intersection of the exposure of humans to the wild dog contact and therefore their rabies transmission. And lastly, I want to talk, highlight the precautionary principle um, when used, you can use it when the harms are considered serious and reversible um, and justify action to guide policy in times of scientific uncertainty. Um, and it allows preventative measures to be taken, even if definitive data in humans is lacking. And it is supported by the government of Canada since 2001. And the key message I have is pharmaceuticals are intended to benefit patients, but they also become contaminants to environment. Diclofenac kills 99.9% .9 of vultures in 15 years. This illuminates how little is known and how tragic this is and the impact of pharmaceutical use on non-target organisms. It is incorrect to assume that chronic low-dose exposures have no impact on other living things. Lack of definitive data does not mean no harm. And when harms are great and irreversible, use the precautionary principle. And that concludes my little section for us today. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Gigi, for your presentation. I, I personally learned a lot over the last few minutes. I, I was not personally aware of uh, the important impacts of pharmaceuticals on the environment. So, so thank you for uh, again for your presentation. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Miles uh, Surgeon. Dr. Surgeon is a family physician and also the executive director of the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, recognizing the intersection between environmental issues and health, he is dedicated to addressing climate change issues. He has co-founded partnerships for environmental action by clinicians and communities for health care facilities, also known as SPEECH. The charity trees for Hamilton in 2012 and the not-for-profit shelter health network in 2005. Dr. Safe Surgeon is the post uh, grad medical education lead for sustainable healthcare at McMaster University. And during his uh, presentation, Dr. Surgeon will share initiatives that can decrease facilities carbon uh, footprint. So Dr. Surgeon, over to you. And I invite you to share uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, can you see it now, Antonin? Perfect, yes, thank you. Okay, good, good. Yeah, it's funny, it took a little while to load. <clears throat> thank you so much for your introduction, and it's great to be on this panel with such uh, wonderful people. Uh, so I will move along here. Yes, yeah, so I am a family doctor in Hamilton, and I am passionate about uh, climate and climate change solutions. I'm just going to highlight some of the uh, solutions sort of from high level without going into detail. And I invite you to 
check out the two main websites that I'm with, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare and Peach Health Ontario, where we have all of these resources. So Jerome actually showed a slide similar to this. This is the total carbon footprint of the world, greenhouse gases per year, starting 1990, bottom left, black line moving up to 2020, um, increase from 40 gigatons per year to 50 gigatons. In order to follow the pathways we need to follow to stay away from rising temperatures, we need to follow the green pathway on the bottom, which is the red line. And I draw that because it just shows how much we need to do in the next uh, seven years. So there are lots of solutions. That's the good news. Uh, we imagine uh, what an ideal green facility might look like. And we have an H for hospital on the front of this, but this could be any number of buildings. And we believe that in order to get to net zero, you need to follow a whole bunch of different things, leadership, education, supply chain, and I'll, I'll touch on each of these. So if you are going to take this on at any facility, arguably even your own house, you need a strategy and you need a person most responsible. I've listed a few hospitals in Ontario which are doing this. They are doing this in different ways, but they all have a strategy and I would say they're all being successful in moving this forward. So the biggest thing is to me is to have a corporate green team which is going after the big items. In our leadership guidebook for hospitals, which you can find on both of those websites, within that guidebook, around page seven or eight, you'll see our action items very simply laid out. This is essentially a Pareto analysis, the 2080 rule. These are the, I think, 22 items we feel are the most important to do at a facility. The point I always make on this slide is this is not just your facilities engineer in the top right buildings and energy. This requires leadership from around your entire building, your food manager, your procurement lead, physicians and clinicians, uh, the pharmacist, drugs and devices. So you need a lot of people involved with this. Choosing wisely, clinicians know this has been around for quite a few years. It's about stewardship of the things that we uh, do in terms of tests, the tests that we order, but this is also about sustainability because every single test we order has a carbon footprint. And so you can actually be a choosing wisely facility, not just a choosing wisely individual, you can look at choosing wisely and you can become a choosing wisely facility. Um, this is drilling down into it. Some U of T medical students a few years ago actually looked at the numbers for MRIs uh, per year and the amount of energy that they use, CT scans, x-rays, and also the amount of money that they use. So you can imagine if you're decreasing your tests by 10%, the kind of impact that can have. Uh, supply chain, this is the scope three stuff that Jerome spoke a lot about. Some would say it's 60, 65%. Jerome obviously found it's as high as 90%. Most of the new studies coming out are saying that this is 80% of the problem. And so this is the stuff, primarily the stuff that we buy. I always talk about the journey of a throwaway gown. It needs to be dug out of the ground. And then it is shipped to manufacturing, shipped to packaging, shipped to the hospital. Then a doc like me wears it for a minute we throw it out, it's incinerated, it's shipped to garbage. That is the linear economy. That is why, without going into all the solutions, we need to always be looking at things which are circular. And the simple example here is a washable gown, which can be used 150 to 200 times and might have a life after that. This, this one shows the journey of a computer. We all use computers. Uh, one route starts in Chile, number one, digging the raw materials out of the ground, then going across to Southeast Asia, number two, then getting shipped further north into Asia for subcontracting, then into China for final assembly, number four, back across to Mexico, number five, up to Canada, number six. This is happening with all the products that we buy that move through our buildings. And we need to think of better ways to do this. And we need to find 
uh, what I would call green suppliers. Drugs and devices, we, we touched on this from a toxic side. This is from the um, carbon footprint side. There are medications which are better than others in terms of their carbon footprint. I think there's a lot of awareness now that meter dose inhalers like Ventolin are equivalent to a 180 kilometer car ride. You can switch to a dry powder inhaler and have minimal impact. Anesthetic gases, this is an old slide I'm showing you. It's now banned in about eight hospitals, thanks to the Ontario anesthetists who are pushing to have this banned because there's other anesthetic gases that can, can be used. And prescribing less medications, we have a ton of polypharmacy in our country, we can do a lot better. Food is super important, uh, both in your personal life and in the facilities you work in. We can move to plant-rich diets. This does align with Canada's food guide. And I'll just quickly show you why this is important because the carbon footprint of food is drastically different depending on the type of food. This is an American slide, so it's in pounds per serving pounds of CO2 per serving. So you have beef on the top and you move through cheese, you know, and, and into the, through the dairy products down to potatoes. So basically I'm saying eat potatoes. Look, you can throw in some carrots and some other plant rich foods, but um, you can see the difference there. Transportation uh, used to be bike friendly, was the queen of green as I would call it. The only problem with bike friendly facilities is the patients aren't usually biking. So virtual medicine, we've learned a lot about that. Can you do that safely in your office? Nobody drives. I also tell people like we're doing today to advocate for the virtual conference. This is a pharmaceutical conference in England. They did a study. They looked at people who did the conference from home in North America on the right using their internet in their office at 10 kilograms of CO2 for the weekend versus people who flew to the conference. Look, I'm not saying don't fly. I'm saying let's advocate for virtual options. It's just a massive difference here. And trees, we started this project in Ontario. It's now a national project to make a national health care forest. So if you have a facility that you think would want a tree, let us know, we'll help facilitate that. Uh, I've talked mainly about hospitals. We also have a green office toolkit. You can look this up. Uh, you will see both Gigi and Jerome in there. I just thought of that. They're both in there. Um, there are many chapters. They're all one pagers. Take a look at the table of contents. Think about what you're passionate about or where your skill set is. And there are many different things that you can do in your office to make it greener. Here's one most people don't think about, which is the fact that end of life care in Canada happens in hospitals. Most Canadians wanna die at home. 80, 85% of Canadians want to die at home. 60% of Canadians die at hospital. We have a ton of people stuck in hospital, not able to get to long-term care, not able to get to home care. We as a society need to think about solutions to this. Hospitals, and I borrowed some data from Jerome on this. Hospitals are about 30 kilograms of CO2 per day. Long-term care drops down to nine kilograms of CO2 day, uh, per day. And home care is less than 1.5 kilograms of CO2 per day. So not only is it good for people, it's good for our system in terms of costs. It's good for the planet. Lots of solutions out there. And I will hand it back to Antonin. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Surgeon, for uh, this great uh, presentation. I was personally, uh, uh, really enjoy, appreciate the leadership guidebook um, to empower leaders and, and team members to, to reduce their impact on the environment. And in the slide you showed on, on the, the journey of a computer, production of a computer, I think it's simple, but it, it, it says what it says, right? So, so thank you very much for, uh, for this again. So our next uh, and last uh, speaker for today is um, Dr. Lorette Geldenhaus, um, who's a professor at Dalhousie University in nephropathology. She has a master's degree in anatomical pathology and medical education. She is chair of the Canadian Association of Pathologists National Specialty Network on the Environment, 
She is secretary of the Doctors Nova Scotia section on planetary health. She is chair of the Nova Scotian Regional Committee of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, also known as CAPE Nova Scotia. And she's also a member of the Lab Green Team, the Board of CAPE, and the Board of Ecology Action Centre. So during her presentation, Dr. Geldenhaus will share an overview of the green healthcare efforts in Nova Scotia. So thank you, Dr. Geldenhaus, and uh, over to you. Thank you. I'm very excited to be a member of this panel and I've really enjoyed the presentation of the panelists thus far. Thank you. So I hope that at the end of my little presentation, uh, you'll be able to describe some green healthcare initiatives at Dalhousie University and Nova Scotia Health. And I, I currently have no conflicts of interest to disclose other than that I'm a member of this panel sponsored by Roche. Um, and uh, so in uh, Nova Scotia, we have uh, several bodies with a focus on planetary health and green health care. And some of these include the Dalhousie Global Health Office, um, Cape NS, as Jerome mentioned, uh, the Doctors Nova Scotia section on planetary health, Choosing Wisely Nova Scotia, and several green teams, including the Dow Med Students, the OR, the Medical Teaching Unit, and the lab. And we formerly had a laboratory utilization committee that did some great work. In the Division of Anatomical Pathology, where I work, uh, we had a green team that evolved into the Divisional Wellness and Green Healthcare Committee. And we plan to include green healthcare in our upcoming AP Divisional Strategic Plan. And I want to tell you briefly about two green healthcare initiatives that we did, um, namely uh, updating the OR exemption list and our Cyto Green Lab certification. So a Choosing Wisely Nova Scotia and a departmental committee came together and updated the list of specimens that are exempt uh, from submission to the laboratory from the OR. And um, uh, there were uh, several items that we identified um, and for which there was a lot of evidence in our research that there was absolutely no benefit to them being submitted to the laboratory, being processed. Um, and uh, so that, but there were two items that were particularly impactful. Those were um, uncomplicated uh, joint surgery specimens, like hip replacements, knee replacements, that sort of thing. And the other one was um, uh, the products of conception produced by uh, just their, uh, a regular termination of pregnancy. Um, and we included, we collaborated with the clinicians to make sure that they were on board with everything. And after we um, updated the exemption list, we did an audit a year later to see um, how many specimens we uh, uh, we saved processing. And our total number of specimens decreased by 10%. Um, we had savings of more than $36,000 in the laboratory alone, and this is for a, a medium-sized um, academic uh, laboratory and about 0.27 technical FTE and 0.25 pathologist FTE. Another project is the Cytopathology Green Lab Certification Project, and we had a fabulous team working away at that. Um, we were offered this opportunity through the Dalhousie University Office of Sustainability, who started a, a Green Labs initiative. And uh, some comments from our team members, Tracy Watts said, I see so much waste every day in the lab, even just a little bit will help. And Chung Wang said, a sustainability should be a habit. And this certification is offered through My Green Lab, which is a not-for-profit uh, US-based organization that helps lab green their practice. So to start off with, uh, we uh, did a survey on which we were scored, and we scored a dismal 32% on our survey. Um, green, my Green Lab suggests that rather than try and fix everything, we should pick six categories and then work away at it, trying to make some improvements. Uh, so there are listed all the different categories we picked, and we'll look at each one of them in turn. Uh, we started off with a little bit of education of our lab, um, including posting these lovely posters given to us by the Adelhousie Office of Sustainability. 
So the first uh, area was plug load. So many of these things are really simple and could be done in any healthcare facility or any place of work. Um, we ensured that all our equipment was switched off at the end of the day. Unfortunately, Energy Star equipment is not mandatory for our health region, but sustainability is included in our RFP scoring. We encouraged our staff to avoid printing and if they had to print, to print double-sided. We confirmed that our fridges were um, regularly serviced, that our warming ovens were only on when in use and that they were at the correct temperature. Similarly, the water baths used um, when we used the cryostat to cut the sections in the lab um, to make sure that the water baths, which warm up the uh, paraffin embedded tissue, to make sure they were at the correct temperature and that they were switched off when not being used. We replaced the LED lights um, with the fluorescent lamps with LED tubes. And uh, when the team who was doing the replacement started off in the cytopathology lab, they were so enthused that they continued and changed it in the entire lab building. Not only did we reduce electricity and cost, but most importantly, we reduced the heat handled by the chillers that supply air conditioning in the summer. We replaced a bunch of old computers that uh, could not be switched off with uh, newer computers uh, that uh, we encourage staff to switch off at the end of the day and that um, and also to change the settings on the computer so that the screen would turn off after a certain period of time and that the PC would go to sleep uh, after a certain period of time as well. The only instrument in our lab which was on 24 seven was our incubator. So the Dalhousie Office of Sustainability gave us a, um, a, a timer, uh, which we set to be on um, only from one hour before we need the incubator until about one hour after we anticipate stop using it, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. on work days only. Um, and we used a plug load monitor to measure the energy consumption before and after switching on this timer. And this graph shows the change in our energy consumption. This is before we switched on the, um, the timer, and this is after. And we reduced our energy consumption by 70%. The next category we tackled was recycling and waste. Um, so the first step was to make sure that we understood what the actual guidelines were. And to um, our great surprise, most of the people working in the lab, including myself, were very vague on what the actual guidelines were. We then looked at uh, what existing measures were already in place and then identified some areas for improvement. So in this previous slide, uh, we see the Halifax Municipal um, Waste Guidelines. And here we see the Nova Scotia health waste categories. Uh, there is the biohazardous waste, the red, different categories of yellow, and then more general waste. And then, of course, always important um, confidential waste. Uh, we also checked with Stericycle, which is the company that um, handles our special waste. And the categories on their website mirrors exactly the categories in the Nova Scotia health guidelines. So next, we looked at what we already had in place. So I am thrilled to report that for many years, we've been recycling formalin as well as xylene and alcohol. Um, a, a few years now, we've had um, recycling containers uh, by the elevator on each floor of the lab building together with some guidelines. And this is also present in lunch rooms. And we've always had paper recycling in the office area. Um, of course, in, a, in a, a healthcare facility, confidential recycling is very important. We've always had um, confidential recycling. We've also been recycling uh, batteries and printer cartridges. However, in the cyto processing lab, absolutely everything went into yellow bags, which forms part of special waste. Nova Scotia health special waste is up to 30 to 50 tons per year per month. And at $1 per kilogram, that's a total of about $50,000 per month, which amounts to more than half a million dollars for a relatively small population of a million people. In the cytopatholo cytopathology processing lab, which is a really small lab, we were producing four yellow bags per week. 
So we decided to um, make some changes there. And just before making the changes, we did notify the staff by the email of the changes that we were going to make. So the first thing we did is we placed a bin for recycling plastics, including cytolite containers, in the um, in the processing lab. And there you can see the uh, cytolite bottles and the um, the plastic trays. And there were several other plastic uh, recyclable items that could be placed in there. The second thing we did is to, was to replace yellow bags, which was available conveniently all over the lab. We replaced them all by black bags for the non-recyclable items and we made sure to remove labels for confidential recycling where relevant and we placed one little black bag in one corner for the appropriate items only and through doing this we were able to reduce our yellow bag use from four to less than one per week um, so more than 75 percent uh, we also started recycling the plastic bags in which we receive pap smears from central accessioning in the lab building. And we plan in future to have discussions with central accessioning to see if rather than even recycling the plastic bags, we can just return them to them for reuse. Generally in the lab, we do use lab equipment um, until the end of its life. And um, lab supplies, consumables and chemicals um, are usually not wasted much. And lab furniture are always placed in storage for reuse in the building. And there is a beautiful, um, a, a very fancy ergonomic chair that I use in my office that I found by uh, fishing it out of the basement in our building. A cold storage, we only have one fridge um, for specimens, not in formalin, in cytopathology. And uh, we, we confirmed that it was in a location with sufficient ventilation and that it was having annual maintenance. Um, we don't use fume hoods in cytopathology. We did, did do a little audit as a side project just about what's happening with fume hoods in the rest of the building, but we only have one biosafety cabinet for specimen processing. And we ensured that the sash was closed as needed and that the light was switched off when not in use. And then lastly, water. Uh, we don't have any particular fancy lab usage uh, for water in our lab, unlike some of the uh, research lab in at Dalhousie. But we did remind staff to use water efficiently. Then the last category was really the, the trickiest one. And as you can see from this diagram from the uh, Lancet, by far the biggest um, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions of health care facilities is the supply chain, which is, as some of my uh, previous uh, pre uh, co-presenters have mentioned, um, it's all the stuff we bring into um, the healthcare facility. There are a few small things that we can do as users. So those include uh, order sustainable options when available. And we do tend to do that in the cytopathology lab, only to, uh, to order the required quantity to consolidate orders. Um, in the rare instances that there is surplus items to exchange them with other labs in the department. I've mentioned before that unfortunately, Energy Star uh, equipment is not mandatory for our organization, but sustainability is included in the RFP scoring. And we tend not to receive unnecessary material from vendors. So um, after doing all these things, we redid our survey and we were um, able to increase our score from 32% to 62%, which doesn't sound that good. Um, however, it is a great um, improvement on our previous uh, performance. And there are some items, um, as you may have ga gathered, uh, which we have very little um, control over, um, particularly per uh, things such as purchasing. And we were able to obtain gold green lab certification. As a result of our projects, we have a, a few other ongoing initiatives. Uh, one of them is to try and encourage the entire lab building to follow the appropriate waste and recycling guidelines. We're looking into glove recycling versus reuse. And we're also looking um, at the rest of the lab building at um, trying to make our ultra low temperature freezer, uh, the use of those, um, more energy efficient. And um, I now hand back to um, Antonin.
Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Geldenhaus, for, for this very inspiring uh, presentation. It's it's remarkable the number, the quantity of examples you share uh, and that you implemented in your own institution that could could inspire other institutions to uh, to reduce their impact on, on the environment. So so thank you uh, very much again. So um, to uh, <clears throat> conclude uh, today's session, let me just share my screen again. You should see it by now. So, um, uh, as I said, to, to, so to conclude today's session, I'll be sharing with you three um, examples, sustainable uh, contributions of, of Roche. Um, and as discussed over the last um, uh, hour or so, um, healthcare as a whole uh, has large environmental uh, impact, uh, no doubt. So, we see uh, the important quantities of waste generated by, by institution. We see uh, operations consume high volumes of energy and water. We see substances of high, uh, very high concern used. And, and complex supply chains are also uh, contributing to uh, greenhouse gas um, emissions. So uh, aligned with the... <clears throat> With, with, with this, um, I wanted to share with you um, an example. So how Roche is reducing the impact of its product um, products on, on the environment. So on this slide, you see uh, a greener version of the reagent cassette uh, that has been launched in, in 2018, uh, so-called the EPAC lead. So the cassette is, is smaller versus uh, a previous uh, version, requires less plastic, and the internal reagent stability is also greater. So this is out, allow us to, to place, in a way, more tests um, into each and every cassette. And at the same time, we can lose uh, less reagent per test. Um, and at the end, uh, institutions and laboratories are able to perform three times more tests with a uh, disk version versus the previous uh, version. So. Since labs have been using uh, this new technology in, in combination with uh, newer versions of uh, analytical units, um, they, they took advantage of a number of, of uh, on a number of fronts. So you can see here a reduction of uh, up to 78% uh, of plastic waste generated by um, uh, each and every uh, test. Water consumption uh, reduced by up to 36% per test as well and uh, less volume of reagents uh, needed per uh, per result, per test. So uh, very, uh, very, very promising. Um, and this is a, a simple example of uh, how you, we can reduce the impact of uh, our products on, on the environment. Um, second, on this side, you can see that uh, there's also a need for more uh, sustainable society. So access to healthcare and diagnostics uh, is limited in some countries. Uh, we have technologies that can only be used in specialty labs. And unfortunately, uh, pretty much around everywhere around the world, we still see uh, discrimination based on gender, uh, sexuality, and, uh, and race. Um, so aligned with uh, the 2015 United Nations uh, Sustainable Goals, we want people to live healthy and happy lives uh, free from uh, poverty. So I wanted to, to share with you one um, example on um, how Roche is, is looking to uh, uh, increase access to diagnostics in some specific uh, markets. So this example is the Cobas plasma separation card, uh, which is currently being piloted in some countries in Africa. So it's a small card that can be used uh, for blood collection in remote locations. So in this case, um, uh, it allows, uh, it, it prevents patients or it doesn't require patients to travel from their location to uh, a main city. So it, one of its uniqueness uh, in a way is that the, the card and um, the sample is tabled throughout uh, transportation to the lab, even in extreme uh, weather conditions. So very interesting for uh, remote areas. So, so the technology has a series of offers a series of benefits. So ease 
the blood uh, sample collection versus uh, resource intensive uh, on-site blood draws, for example. It drives centralized uh, molecular testing, which Roche has, Roche has optimized in, in some of those uh, regions. Facilitates uh, long-term uh, monitoring, and last but not least, uh, support growth in servicing remote uh, locations. So this is a, a simple example on how uh, we are trying to increase uh, access to diagnostics in some regions of the world. And um, last but not least, um, around the world, we see uh, healthcare system budgets that are constantly uh, increasing year after year. Uh, so th there's a real way uh, and a real need, sorry, for more sustainable health economies. So as you can see here, uh, resources are limited. Uh, demand for trained uh, healthcare professionals um, is greater than than the available availability or, or supply, and, and there are numbers of a number of disparities uh, that affect the quality of life. So we need to find ways um, to better allocate resources to match uh, the needs of of population. So I wanted to, to share uh, with you one example of potential cost savings uh, related to the implementation of a biomarker uh, in an institution. So diagnostic utility of nt NT in this case is in heart failure has been documented over the years. Um, and we, we see different uh, benefits uh, shared on this slide. So on the initial diagnosis of heart failure, so the implementation of nt NT has been shown to lead to reduction um, in time spent at the uh, emergency department by 40 minutes um, on average. It also led to a 9% reduction in equal cardiograms, saving efforts and resources at the same time. And for uh, monitoring heart failure patients, uh, the implementation of NT Pro BNP allowed a, a reduction of 35%, um, reduction of, so 35% fewer visits um, of, of patients uh, re-hospitalized uh, within the first two months. And some studies also show a uh, 15% uh, cost reduction um, while uh, introducing NT Pro BNP for monitoring of heart failure uh, patients. So this is one of the many examples we have at Roche uh, that demonstrate the value of a in vitro diagnostic. So on this, um, our mission again, doing now what uh, patients uh, need next. I think it's it's totally aligned with the today's subject, uh, sustainability. So um, on that note, I'll um, I'll stop sharing my screen. So uh, we'll be moving to a Q and A uh, period and uh, and discussion. Um, I invite all participants. Um, as read in the chat box, um, to ask their their own questions. And um, you, you can also vote for your uh, preferred question. So uh, uh, during the uh, the exchange and the discussion, and um, you also see a, a demographic poll um, and a few questions asked like this one um, that you can answer and, and the results will be shared uh, along the way uh, at, at the end. And uh, to make us, to make sorry to make future improvements, um, the CSPC would like uh, your feedback on on today's uh, session. So we also invite you to fill uh, the feedback poll uh, at the end of uh, today's presentation uh, before going to uh, going back to your uh, regular activities. So um, we'll 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 start. Uh, Maybe what a question I'd like to, to ask first uh, to kick off this this Q and A uh, portion of today's uh, presentation, uh, maybe by asking your your personal perspective on how healthcare could better work with industry uh, to improve sustainability. And um, I think having all of us today on the same panel demonstrate uh, some collaboration. But I'd be curious to hear your your respective uh, perspective, and maybe Dr. Surgeon, maybe we can uh, we can start with you if you have uh, anything to share with us. Well, <clears throat> I think you know, Antonin, that uh, in Ontario we have a working group uh, started as a peach, which is the provincial sustainability group, uh, reaching out to the procurement leads of hospitals 
to uh, educate them really on the importance of adding sustainability to the RFPs or to the scoring of all the products that we buy. And, um, you know, traditionally we look at cost and quality and we don't add sustainability. And so that is really what we need to do in our sector. This is happening in other sectors. Uh, but clearly as part of that, it starts with uh, letting our suppliers and vendors know that that's the direction that we're going. I know that at the hospital system I work at, a letter was sent out in May to 1,200 vendors to say we are going to be looking for greener products and um, kind of gives uh, industry a heads up that that's the direction that we're going. And, and uh, you know, it, it's interesting because I hear all these different groups involved. There's surgeons and anesthetists that want certain products. And then there are hospital procurement leads that might be looking for certain products. And then there's the vendors and, and everybody needs to work together and communicate. And, and I, I will hear about uh, finger pointing, for example. Um, I can I can talk about MRI machines. The idea that an MRI machine doesn't have to die at the end of its life. Some of the MRI machine could be refurbished. Um, you know, I, I hear from the hospital side that industry needs to do this, but I've heard from the industry side that hospitals want new machines. So we, we do need to communicate about this and sort these problems out because they are they are big problems. And, and again, as I was saying in my talk, we do need to move to circular circular economies and figure out how to do that in all the products that we use. Perfect. Thank you very much. Anybody else would like to, to share a perspective or uh, how we can better collaborate? Maybe Dr. Geldenhaus, I'd be curious to see, you shared a number of examples. Um, have you collaborate with, collaborated with with some vendors on, on a few of them or, uh, or, or they were mainly, I mean, driven and, and implemented by, uh, by your team? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the biggest challenge was the supply chain. And um, we have a very, um, it's it's very difficult for us to, as a small little lab, to demand um, from vendors something sustainable. Um, firstly, uh, the volume of what we are purchasing is so small. And secondly, um, there is the overarching structure. There is the, the whole health authority um, which uh, it does all the negotiations and um, puts in place all the rules. So um, what has been very clear to me um, uh, always, but particularly recently and particularly after um, an excellent presentation that I was privileged to be able to, um, to listen to um, on um, Monday night. Uh, it was given here in Halifax and it was given by Andrew McNeil, who is um, at the, uh, the um, Vancouver General Hospital. And she is leading a team which is at the province-wide level um, implementing green healthcare in BC. And I was uh, deeply impressed and, and really deeply envious because we don't have anything like that in Nova Scotia. And I think every single province needs to have something like that. From what I understand from her, um, uh, sustainability has been identified as, uh, as a core um, healthcare um, uh, strategic uh, uh, goal. And, and, and because of that, uh, this this committee, this, this team was formed with her leading the team, and it's no longer up to um, you know small little volunteer green teams to come together and think, oh, what can we do? We can maybe do this in the lab, and then the managers say, no, 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 we don't have time for that. Um, what we really need is for it to come from the top down, for there to be a, a group of experts who who really understand what it is that we need, who go out find the evidence everything has to be evidence-based and then simply create the guidelines and then the guidelines are followed so um and if we have that in place then then at that high level those groups can then work with industry and can simply say i'm sorry you don't have what we need um 
this is what we need and and then the the volume of the of the products that are being provided is so large that industry um you know that that they'd be really motivated to then produce plus they can be a group who can really communicate to industry who really understands this is a way that we found in the UK we're in France that does it this way can you give us this as well so um i think that's what we really really need but in the interim um as they say better light a candle than curse the darkness i think every little bit we we need to be working at both fronts both at the little tiny bits of make sure that cytolite bottle doesn't go into the yellow bag put it in the recycling bin <laughs> to like continuing to advocate for each province for an uh, for a sustainability team thank you perfect thank you uh, very much i see uh, jerome you you raised your hand you have something else to uh... Yeah, here. Yeah, let's just uh, add uh, my understanding of what's happening in Quebec. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all the public health organizations, they, they are, you know, it's uh, not necessarily mandatory, but, you know, they are forced to work with uh, a group purchasing organization. There is only one in Quebec uh, involving not only healthcare organizations, but also school, you know, everything that's governmental. The problem is that, you know, healthcare organizations want to do, uh, you know, uh, EPP, uh, eventually suppliers, they want to sell, you know, products that answer this. But the problem is that the government is not there yet. So they don't have, you know, the, the, the system in place to just accept and push EPP. So we are still at, you know, and probably you know it well, uh, uh, working for a, for a supplier, you know, it's always the smallest price for something, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, you don't have a global vision. It's never, for example, you know, the, the taking into account the, the all impacts of a, a, a purchasing. So it's only the price you know when you're buying it and you don't care about waste management you don't care about everything else you know before and after so that probably should should you know there, there's some lobby to do with the governments just to to tell them you know you should be there and we are a bit slow because the system is like this and we you know we cannot do what we want because of the system yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jerome. And, and, and there's light at the end of the tunnel. We, we see more often a uh, sustainability clause added in, in, in RFP documents. Some are very soft, but others uh, are getting slowly but surely uh, stronger. So um, uh, do you have something else to, uh, to add? <clears throat> yes, I do. I just had a few extra points about industry and what um, things they could do with the um, because it's regarding actually two key things. It's reusable personal protective equipment. And I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and I'm just going to throw it out here for the group is reusable gowns is a very common thing. Um, but um, in pharmacy, inpatient hospital, often we do stale compounding for stale products like IV antibiotics, etc. cetera. Um, and we have to use hair covers. And we why don't we make reusable hair covers and launder that too? So I've always wondered that and related like, the booties, we call them booties. So they're shoe covers, um, same thing. Like why do every time our staff go in and out of the room with the requirements, especially for chemo compounding, where it's a greater frequency of changing some of their things in and out and they have to go in and out. And every time they go in, they wear it for an hour and they have to throw it out and put two more pairs on. And so I think there's great opportunity to do other reusable PPE. That's not just gown. Yeah, there's a bonnet to start and shoe cover. Amazing if we could chip away at that. And topic two is expiry dates on medication. Um, I've always wondered why, if, if you can, if the companies continued to do the stability testing, you could always update that it's longer. Um, and with the COVID pandemic, some things magically had longer dating as some of you may or may not had known that we couldn't use before. And so um, I realized, you know, the profit part is needed for the company, but at the same time, I feel it's an artificial expiry date. It's not a real one. And I think that drives a lot of our waste and therefore contamination to environment as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Sorry. You wanted to add something? Yeah. 
Oh, well, yeah, in response to, to Gigi's question, I, I'm not going to mention any industry names here, but Gigi, can you write me the question and I'll flip it to one or two places and see if people can make, uh, you know, boots in particular? Okay. I, I don't see why that's not not possible. And this is exactly what Antonin is asking. Why can't we work with with industry? And I'm sure there's there's an opportunity there, right? And I, I couldn't agree more about the the med uh, expiration uh, dates. I think, uh, Gigi, you've probably seen our options for the sustainable prescriber, and we actually do mention that in there. There's a whole bunch of options out there, which I would currently call European. Uh, the Europeans are doing some of these things. I mean, as you know, that the the Swedes, I believe, have that way of rating meds based on their toxicity. You're probably aware of that. Um, and there, there's a fair number of things that are going on. There's something called pharma swap in Europe, which I think is more based on outpatient pharmacy and the idea that you can look at your your stock and say, gosh, we have way too many iron tablets. They're going to go, uh, they're going to expire fairly soon and we're not going to sell them all and, and work with other pharmacies. These are unopened products and be basically trading products before they expire. So lots of ideas out there that we could be doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just looking at the time, um, I would like to, to invite each and every one of you to um, may, maybe share with the audience uh, the, the key takeaway uh, of your respective um, presentation. If you can take a, a minute or so to uh, to leave the audience with a key message. Anyone would like to, to jump in first? I can begin. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was talking about, about climate change, uh, specifically about mitigation. Uh, I think, you know, healthcare organizations must be leaders in this. You know, we are, uh, you know, as organizations, we, we will face, you know, be at the first, the front of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, of everything that will be happening. So I think it's, it's like common sense that, healthcare organizations just play a leading role in this, whether the government are, are be, behind them or not, they should be leaders. You know, that's the, the there is no question about this. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I'll, I'll, look, I'll jump in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll save the best for last, which is uh, <laughs> the other two, but... Uh, so we, we do have a climate crisis. Change must happen. Um, this, is, this is not extreme thought anymore. We are not tree huggers here. This should be normal behavior in society. Think about how we can be better stewards for our planet. So I encourage everybody to take action and make your voice heard if you care about this. There is so much you can do in your home, in your community, and it's your office. Thank I'll go much. next and Easy. we can see best for last with uh, Lorette. Um, I think takeaway is uh, prevention is, is the way to go. Um, and so in terms of minimizing entry to the environment, I think if you're a prescriber or you're at the interface of supporting a prescriber to de-prescribe or address polypharmacy or um, rationalize medication, um, that I guess we really lost Gigi this time. Oh, she's back. Every time I talk, it wants me to stop. Um, <laughs> um, where was I? I said prescribers. So deprescribing polypharmacy, that's upstream because the human use enters it. And then if your clinician is supporting the rationalization, um, that would be helpful. If you're a nurse that gives meds, you can collect or chart the data so that the clinicians can make informed decisions. Like, are they constipated? Not, are they bleeding? Signs of, you know, all those things. That's very helpful if you're a nurse or helping support those roles. And then downstream is to set up the proper waste segregation streams and follow the policies and, and be stewards for at least if we have the waste, we're actually managing it properly, at least to minimize the risks. Excellent, thank you very much, Shiji. All right. Um. So uh, um, similar to what I've mentioned before, I think we need to work on this um, 
this um, the environmental impact of healthcare at two fronts. Firstly, um, <clears throat> what perhaps I'm hoping my presentation illustrated is that there are a bunch of extremely simple things you can do. Just follow the guidelines that are already there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it's so simple. It's just a matter of doing it. So that's one thing. The other thing is um, we do need um, leaders at the very top to be on board for there to be a governance structure that and, and we have to all work together industry with the healthcare um, providers we all have to work together and then the last thing um, which is um, not specific to healthcare but my um, one of my um, great climate heroes is uh, Catherine um, Hayhoe, who's a Canadian climate scientist, part of the IPCC group, and she works in Texas, and she wrote an amazing book. If you're feeling um, climate anxiety, her book, uh, Saving Us, is, is really excellent, and um, she says that the most important thing you can do, the most important climate action you can do is to talk about it. So we talked about it and some of my co-panelists very eloquently. So thank you very much. Excellent, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Um I see there's a question or a comment in the in the QA. Yeah, re reduction. So Someone's asking um, global perspective and based on Roche experience, how Canada is compared with other countries in emission reduction based on experience and interactions with uh, regulatory affairs. So, so very rapidly, we have our, we have our goals. Um, I think regulations is, is, is key here and we see major differences between North America and Europe. Uh, so all the initiatives I, I shared in the um, projects, uh, some projects are, are even coming from uh, from customers, from institutions in Europe. While I think we have not reached um, that uh, that stage yet, um, we don't have all uh, passionate um, uh, pathologists like Dr. Geldenhaus uh, putting in, into practice um, and implementing um, initiatives to, to reduce um, impact uh, the way you explained, uh, but, but certainly regulations and requirements are, are stronger today uh, in Europe. Uh, I said a word or two on, on uh, sustainability uh, clauses that we see coming, uh, at least in the province of Quebec and slowly but surely also outside, um, requiring uh, a sustainable a sustainability uh, project program in place, uh, specific goals, but uh, the sooner the better uh, those requirements can come. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll allow industry and healthcare uh, to work uh, better together to, to make the right things uh, at the end of the day. So um, so that would be, I guess, my, my closing remark. Um, and uh, I, I wanna, uh, thank you, uh, my expert panelist, um, for joining us uh, today. It has been a real uh, privilege and pleasure to, to collaborate uh, with you over the last uh, couple of weeks to uh, to put together uh, today's session. Um, I'll, I'll thank uh, you also on behalf of my colleagues at Roche and maybe a word for, for the participants. Um, we hope that uh, today's session is uh, encouraging you uh, more than ever to contribute to greener healthcare. And uh, you had a number of examples uh, shared with you today. So um, again, thank you very much for your participation and I wish you uh, a great day and uh, see you soon in an upcoming uh, panel discussion on sustainability. Thank you very much. <laughs>